Good morning and welcome to University United Methodist Church. We are so excited to have you here to worship with us today on World Communion Sunday as we remember that Jesus gave his life, the blood, and the body for us. Please rise as you are able and join us for Thank You Jesus for the Blood. remain standing for our next song, Great Are You, Lord.
be seated. Good morning. It is great to hear your voices. It's great to see your faces. But most of all, it's great to see the tapestry of life that God has brought us to being here today. All of you created by God give us a sense of amazement of what God is doing all the time. You have a, a couple of inserts in your bulletin in reference to today, which we will be celebrating throughout the day, throughout this worship service of being Worldwide Communion Day. But I would also like to bring to your attention uh, a couple of other things. Um, you're going to hear me in the message, perhaps, talking about soul food today. Soul food. Now, don't think we're going to go on the train down to New Orleans. But I'm talking to you about soul food that the church understands. The church, you and I, understand. And that's the bread and the cup. But we in the United Methodist Church do a lot with food. Some of you may have just come up from the dining area and experienced that. But next Sunday, following the service, uh, the United Methodist Women, now Women of Faith, will be hosting a brunch. So plan to come specifically next Sunday to be hungry. Hungry not just for the word, but for the food also to follow. I'd ask that you join me in our invocation for this Sunday. God of spirit and flesh, God of heaven and earth, God of grape and grain, we spread our wings in flight toward you. We stretch our arms in need of you. We feed ourselves with gifts from you. We thank you for your love poured out as we sense your spirit shining in the sunlight, sailing on the fallish wind, and singing in the souls of each one gathered here. Recreate us in your image as we encounter you today, that our lives may ignite a love to light the world where despair drips dreary on drowning dreams, and where heavy hearts shiver in the lonely cold, let your presence pressing through us infuse the world with joy. Amen. And if you are able, I would invite you to stand for our opening song.
you may be seated. What we know as World Communion Sunday was initiated in 1933. So give us 10 more years, just 10, and it will be 100 years old. 100 years, nearly, a people of every Christian background possible coming together on this day to celebrate the unity in knowing what it means to have the blood of Christ and the bread of Christ given to them. It was actually begun by one of our sister churches, the Presbyterians. Back in 1933, they had a pastor at this Presbyterian church in <clears throat> Pittsburgh. And he began, and like most churches, you know, a pastor has an idea, and it, sometimes it takes forever to get the crust off the outer seed of the idea, to get it beginning to grow. And he became, uh, at times, hopeless, but at other times he realized that there was power in churches who prayed and sang and read the word all at one day one day being united in the faith wherever they sat whatever town whatever city whatever village and partaking of what god gave us through jesus christ we in the united methodist church joined wholeheartedly then it was the methodist church and the evangelical united brethren and then when they came together in 68 they said yes we're going to do this and we have continued to do it as a celebration of unity and service so trevor with your help they can hear more from some other voice than mine when was the last time you shared a meal with someone on the other side of the world Jesus prayed that we would be one, yet when we look at the world today, too often we see his followers divided while the world's most pressing needs go unaddressed. If we focus on the forces that pull us apart, it's easy to feel discouraged, overwhelmed, and anything but united. But on World Communion Sunday, the first Sunday in October, we celebrate what binds us together, the love of Christ that empowers us to make this world a better place as one people committed to one purpose. This rich ecumenical tradition of World Communion Sunday that began about 80 years ago celebrates the diversity of believers of all ethnic backgrounds. Through your generous gift on this special Sunday of the United Methodist Church, we do more together to promote unity by empowering education. Your support provides scholarships and in-service training programs for U.S. racial and ethnic students and international students on both undergraduate and graduate levels, giving them tools they need to transform the world. Together, we equip students from around the globe to shape a unified future in so many ways by helping the least of these know the mercy and love of Jesus. As believers unite on World Communion Sunday, our bread may be different, but we share our love for the bread of life. As we share the fruit of the vine, our commitment to follow the example of Jesus unites us. Together, as engaged disciples, we give on World Communion Sunday to promote unity and empower passionate students to tear down the walls that divide us and lead us to do more through our shared communion in Christ. Together, we do more. There was no way I could have possibly improved, particularly on that line, that last line, together we can do more. And that's what call, God calls us to being. When we, I lead in a pastoral prayer, it's bringing all together. So when it comes time for the offering, you have an envelope. If you want to give to that special need, please use that envelope 
and the counters will make sure it goes to the right place. Let us turn to God in an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, it is amazing when we stop and think of the power and possibility that you offer us as we extend our hands and our hearts to be one in this global community that you created. We gather as a people connected throughout the world to praise your holy name. We know that Christ's sacrifice for us all connects us through the bread and the grape as we partake in the great thanksgiving of our faith. Make us grateful for our diversity, even in our oneness. Bless especially the peoples of all languages who celebrate with us today. May Christians everywhere feel the strong link of our communion in the one God, Christ, and Holy Spirit. We particularly lift up those who are grieving on this day and pray for the peace that does pass all understanding to be enveloping their hearts. We pray for those who are trying to keep the faith and the strength as they journey with illness and even diagnoses which they would never have sought. And we pray for those who are lost, literally lost and looking in all the wrong places for something to fill their lives with purpose and hope. We ask your blessing to be upon all who are in need. As we celebrate this feast together, remind us all of your blessings in this meal with whom on this day we share with the world. We ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are so excited to welcome back Jody Sheldon, who will be soloing for us and joining us on her, oh, her instrument is a saxophone, I can speak, will be joining us with her saxophone as we sing for you Amazing Grace.
Did you ever have a moment where you just knew it was a God thing? Have you ever had that? You see, that's what was happening to me just now because they had no idea my sermon title was the ultimate soul food. You just ventured into the soul world, folks. Why don't you give them an affirmation of thank you again? And it's so much fun to follow something like that with an opportunity to give back to God called the offering. So as our ushers come forward, I'd ask that you respond to what God has given you. Please rise as you are able for the singing of the doxology. Loving God, our hunger is never better satisfied than at your table. Our gifts can have no higher value than when they are offered to you. Because you fill our spirits, we hunger to serve. And we pray that these gifts may be as food, food to nourish the entire global living body of Christ, the church. Amen. And you may be seated. So the scripture that is printed in your bulletin is not wrong, but it has been changed. Meaning, I did that. 
It's John 6, but verses 24 through 35. Hear these words. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus replied, I assure you that you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate all the food you wanted. Don't work for the food that doesn't last, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the human one will give you. God the Father has confirmed him as his agent to give life. They ask, what must we do in order to accomplish what God requires? And Jesus replied, this is what God requires, that you believe in him whom God sent. They ask, what miraculous sign will you do that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, sir, give us this bread all the time. And Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations that are on the hearts of all of us, O God, be acceptable unto you, for you are our strength and you are our Redeemer. Amen. I have literally experienced people when they have approached a bakery and they're hungry almost turn animalistic. I don't know if you've ever experienced that or maybe you've been one of those people but when the scent of those baked goods, that fresh bread, whatever it might be, begins to hit you, it's almost like a real struggle for control. I have absolutely observed people, particularly United Methodists, because I hang out more with them, but I have seen them at conference events, better known as my mother always used to refer to them, church stuff events. They break into line. I mean, it's been amazing to watch United Methodists at work when food is placed before them. You know, I, I've stood back and I've watched people just say, oh, I've just been starving to death all morning. Would you let me go to the front of the line? And the person behind says, well, I've been starving to death all morning too. Could I just go to the front of the line with you? And before long, five or six of those people who were about in the center of that beginning part of the line have now all moved up in a little groupie to the front of the line. And then after they get their food, when you really observe, and that's kind of like what I like to do in life, when I observe and they sit down and they start eating, they start not eating as what I would call eating, inhaling. It comes closer to it, inhaling. And then if they know, aren't quite sure what's on the plate, they start taking their fork or their knife or their spoon and moving stuff around to check it out. Now, mind you, those were the people that were saying to the rest of us, they're starving to death, so why would they take the time to check it out? I've never figured that out. And then 
it gets more exciting. It only takes them about five to six to seven minutes to inhale the food. And then they sit there and say, well, what's next? Let's move on. Let's just move on. The end of the line has only progressed about three feet. But they're ready to move on because their needs were satisfied. It's an interesting dynamic we in the church and out of the church have about food. I was excited several years ago now when I learned that the Great Harvest Bread Company was opening an establishment in Peoria. Now there are two. But I went in and just kind of checked it out and thought this is nothing more than a place of eternal sin. (laughs) This needs to be shut down immediately. This will bring people to their knees begging for a thick slice of warm bread with maybe as thick as the bread is, butter piled on top of it. And then if you're really lucky, a a long supply of that artificial, no, it's not artificial, that natural sugar sweet taste called honey. The idea is once you start taking a piece of, a bite of that bread, you aren't going to leave until you take more with you. It's a great marketing tool. Great marketing tool. Feed them. Feed them. That hand-kneaded kind of bread is something that we in this country, a few years ago during the pandemic, became reacquainted with. Most people never had time to knead and make bread anymore. We said that anyway. Because about 20, 25 years before that, there was this remarkable invention called the bread machine. Yeah, the bread machine. So it didn't take nearly as long, and we could go on and do our own thing and still inhale that wonderful scent of fresh bread, whether it be honey, wheat, cinnamon, walnut, country French breads, among anything else, and the recipes just kept being invented over and over. But what we do know is people enjoy looking for good bread, bread with character, bread with character, not the mass-produced, square-bodied, chemically-preserved, white, doughy bread. Give me a piece of something I can bite into that will stick to my ribs. Jesus knew. He knew that what maybe I would say my grandmother did, or even now Great Harvest does, and every artesian baker knows that there's no substitute. There is no substitute for the character, the nutrition, the taste, and experience of fresh, filling, and fulfilling real bread. Real bread. And that's what Jesus is trying to say to those who followed him in the scripture. That he's the real bread. He is it. He's the bread of life. And he says true bread comes from heaven. That which gives life to the world. He's bread and it's conceived in the mind of the real master artisan. God, the maker of all. So what caused me to wonder is what is the church? Is it not supposed to be a bakery outlet? Whoa. Wonder if that would attract people. Offering the real bread of life, though. Now, that's the difference. The real bread of life. A hungry world is lining up and looking for something to fill this gnawing emptiness in the pit of the collective hearts. We don't have to go far, any which way, from right where we are right now to run into people 
who are living with that gnawing hunger of knowing the real bread of life. Bread for the journey. That's what I'd like to think of it being. Because you see, I've got to live with my soul until my earthly life ends. So I need to have my soul well fed with the real bread for the journey. Now sometime this week, you'll make a trip to the grocery store to get, probably, a loaf of bread. It will be available on the shelf, and you'll see a wide variety to choose from. You probably will pay little attention to the price, not realizing that the packaging that the bread is in, is wrapped in, actually costs more than the wheat that's in the bread. Hello. Think about that. All in all, you'll think it is a very uneventful trip, but you'll be wrong. It's quite difficult for me as a person who is comfortably living in these United States to understand the importance of bread. Unless I turn on my TV and watch what's going on in so many other parts of the world today. When there is no staff of life, there is suffering and famine. A simple loaf of bread, something which we do not give a second thought, but in certain parts of the world, it literally means life itself. I, for one, have never understood the one who says I'm Christian and then begins to draw boundaries out beyond what it means for me to be Christian. And so often leaves the rest of the world out. Is it really possible to think that God only created me and not everyone else in the global community? If it is, then somebody needs to edit the biblical text because the texts are clear, created for all. Just think about this. It's only as we comprehend that situation that others who don't have can we really begin to understand the importance of bread, not only now, but also in the time of Jesus. Just think for a moment of how so many significant theological events in the Bible revolve around the subject of bread. The most important event in the Old Testament, of course, was the Exodus event, that trip from Egypt to the Promised Land. But what caused the Hebrews to be in Egypt in the first place? It was for the need, the want of having bread. And when the wheat crop had failed due to drought, the Hebrews had migrated to the land of the Pharaoh because there was a surplus in storage there of wheat. It was bread or the lack of it that initiated this whole chain of events. Isn't it fascinating that moving on in the biblical literature, for those of you who want a biblical sermon, you're getting it today, but for moving on in the biblical literature, that Jesus having grown up, learned all these stories, is now saying, look, it wasn't Moses that fed you. It was God. Now, look at where you and I are. It's God that cares for us. Over and over, bread is central to the major stories of the Bible. But, to satisfy your hungry, hunger for heaven, you cannot just eat the bread of the earth. There was a time when my younger brother worked for a company that had bread as a part of 
what he had to do selling it. Only he would sell it by, <laughs> believe it or not, orders of train cars. This was not your local person just driving a bread delivery truck. And he said to me at one point, you know, the worst thing about all this is sometimes the bread moves not the way the train car is moving. And it ends up being smashed. And it's not any good. When you start to unload it, it's, it's ruined. And then he said, you know, it's too bad there, there isn't some pantry or some outlet we could give that ruined bread too. Now I know you're just getting to know me, but there's nothing more offensive to me than that. Because you see, God looks upon all of God's children as worthy of the best, not the worst, not the damaged, but the best. All of God's children deserve the best, which is why Christ was given to us. To satisfy our hunger for heaven, my friends, we have, we have to eat the bread of heaven. So I invite you on this day to prepare in your hearts and minds to do that. Because the journey continues. Faith always moves forward. Life is a continuous series of journeys. Through all of them, ultimately, our aim is to nurture faith in ourselves, faith in each other, and faith in God. All these journeys lead us to the final grand judgment the final journey to eternity. So on your behalf, and specifically for me, because I know me, good Lord, give us bread to feed our souls. Amen. Please remain seated and take a moment of silent reflection as Chris and I lead our song of preparation. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good to glorify you at all times and in all places, O God. Through your living word, you created all things and pronounced them good. 
You made human beings in your own image, persons capable of entering relationships both with you and with each other. From Abraham and his wives, Sarah and Hagar, you brought forth nations of peoples. You shared your grace with these nations. Through prophets, rabbis, and teachers, you have sought to be in loving relationship, even when we have sought to go our own ways. You have called us as sisters and brothers to be a great family. We have brought others pain and heartache, and yet you offer us a way of reconciliation. So today, we join with all your people on earth, praising your name in an unending song, saying, Holy, In the fullness of time, you sent the chosen one, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, your own, to call your splintered creation together again. He came preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins, and to those who responded, he announced they are joint heirs of eternal love with him. When the stubborn forces of evil threatened to to end his life, he called his followers together took bread, broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Then he passed the cup and invited all, Drink from this, it is my blood of the new covenant, do this in remembrance of me. Now on this day, his followers all around the world are gathering at table to remember and share, and we are among those coming to this feast of love. In remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. O holy God, creator of all peoples and worlds, send now upon this bread and cup your living... bread and the cup are here for you. As the ushers will direct you, come and partake of the soul food. Amen. was a wretch, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, my breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne do will 
here inside there at the cross you paid the debt i owe broke my chains beat my soul for the first time i had hope thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you jesus it has washed me white thank you jesus you have saved my life brought me from the darkness into glorious light took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me to the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls our sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our fathers through the blood, the blood. So thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, you have washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light.
just for the fun of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. God made certain God's people would always be loved. You've just received that love. Let us stand for the closing song.
bread at this table, go to feed the hungry. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing that you have received from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each of you always. Amen. Do all the good you can in all Wow. 